it has been a while since I've played Sonic Adventure 2. As a big fan of Sonic Adventure, I looked forward to the sequel and purchased it when it came out on the Dreamcast back in 2001. I hated it. Thanks to the power of the Wayback Machine, I was able to find some of my original ramblings from June 28, 2001, just five days after release, and younger me sounds a lot like the fanbase of today. For example, I stated, the stages are also more restricted. I miss those huge stages. The original was more Sonic, so to speak. They are trying to evolve Sonic into something he is not, and I found the result not a whole lot of fun. Sonic has always been on the cutting edge of cool in both graphics and gameplay mechanics. It is funny reading these comments because it sounds like the same complaints different generations of Sonic fans make about the Sonic games they do not like. Moreover, of course, my old comments are not subjective and lacking in any sort of substance. However, there were a few nuggets of analysis. It took me 47 freaking minutes to get through one of Knuckles' stages. I had to do the Rouge's 5 minutes or less stage 20 times before I cleared it. Those two characters were ruined. While some find the polarizing nature of the adventure titles to be a recent phenomenon, it is not historical revisionism. Arguments regarding the quality of the adventure titles began upon their release. Of course, this video is not about my trip down memory lane. This video is about Sonic Adventure 2, perhaps the most beloved and loathed Sonic game of all time. So let us dive in. First, I think it's important to note Sonic Adventure 2 makes some dramatic improvements over the first game in terms of structure. There are no longer six campaigns to play through, instead just two. The biggest benefit is the lack of repeated cutscenes, which would repeat up to four times in Sonic Adventure. Instead of offering fresh perspectives or revealing new information, they often padded out the playtime. In Sonic Adventure 2, there are just two campaigns, and the streamlined approach fits the storytelling abilities of Sonic Team much better. Another improvement is the lack of hub worlds. Please note, I find nothing inherently wrong with hub worlds as a concept. However, in Sonic Adventure, they hit upgrades with little in-game purpose, created a lot of needless backtracking thanks to strange level placement, and they often made the player walk from cutscene to cutscene for no real reason. It dragged the pace of the game down. Thankfully, Sonic Team seemed to agree and eliminated them. Character upgrades are located in stage, and one never has to walk to trigger a cutscene. Anyway, to further this point about pacing, players will be racing down City Escape within about one minute of selecting the hero campaign. In Sonic Adventure, it takes nearly five minutes from selecting Sonic's campaign to racing along the beaches of Emerald Coast. It is clear to me Sonic Team learned something and worked to improve upon the things that worked in the first game and ditched the mechanics that didn't work. This includes not only the structure of the adventure, but the amount of playstyles as well. I concluded in my previous video that Sonic, Knuckles, and Gamma had the best campaigns. The three gameplay styles were sufficiently different, suited the level layouts, and offered the most compelling stories with the least amount of fluff. It seems Sonic Team reached the same conclusion, as these are the playstyles making it into Sonic Adventure 2. Of course, there are still six playable characters, with Sonic speed stages, Tails shooting stages, and Knuckles' hunting stages making up the hero campaign, then mirrored with Shadow, Eggman, and Rouge in the Dark campaign. Stages are not duplicated either, with different set pieces utilized for two different playstyles, or the stages being sufficiently different when the same playstyle is used. Think of it like in Act 1 and Act 2. On the surface, these changes should make Sonic Adventure 2 a slam dunk. Streamlined progression, reduced repetition, less duplicated story. Even with the improvements, however, Sonic Adventure 2 is far from perfect. Sticking with the theme of polarizing, the best place to start with Sonic Adventure 2 is the story. The game opens with Sonic escaping a helicopter manned by an organization called Gun. However, I cannot help but notice the dialogue. People often proclaim modern Sonic games are bad because Sonic is always cracking corny jokes that are out of character. However, here we are. Talk about low budget flights, no food or movies, I'm out of here, I like running better. Moving along, Sonic runs into Shadow and quickly surmises he has been mistaken for this mysterious new hedgehog. This is reasonable enough. Despite being a point of contention for others, I do not have a problem with cartoon-style tropes of mistaken identity. However, what I do find cringy is how these two knuckleheads keep calling each other fake hedgehogs. Clearly, there is more than one hedgehog on the planet. You know, like Amy. It seems the writers could have been more clever in developing the rivalry. However, more importantly, 
importantly, Shadow the Hedgehog uses Chaos Control to warp out of Sonic's path. This setup offers payoff later in the adventure, something often lacking in Sonic Adventure 1. Moving along is Knuckles and Rouge. Somehow, the Master Emerald is not on Angel Island, but instead in the desert, and these two characters argue over ownership. Same as ever, Eggman appears and snatches it, leaving me to wonder why Knuckles is the one guarding it when he is so bad at it. I don't want to nitpick here, but when I'm told the characters, world building, and story are the reasons the adventure titles are so good, and that modern Sonic games need to go back to the adventure style storytelling, then I feel diving into these idiosyncrasies is fair game. Anyway, before Eggman is able to fly away with the Master Emerald, Knuckles smashes it, freeing Chaos. Wait. Chaos is no longer locked inside the Master Emerald? Weird. The cutscene sets up Knuckles' hunting stages yet again, and offers a little tension between Knuckles and Rouge for later on. Therefore, despite the inconsistencies, it works. What is consistent is Tails' introduction. After hearing about Sonic's misdeeds on satellite TV, he heads to Prison Island to break him free. Upon arrival, he notices Amy is in trouble and transforms the tornado into mech form, thus giving explanation to his shooting gameplay style. After freeing Sonic from his cell, Amy reveals Shadow and Eggman are working together on something, setting up scenes later in the Dark campaign. Set up? Payoff. So, with the characters all revealed, it is time for some stakes. It's not enough Shadow is wreaking havoc and Sonic is getting the blame. No, Eggman is most definitely still the main antagonist. Not only does he hijack every TV signal on the planet, he uses an orbiting space station and blows up the freaking moon. He then gives the planet 24 hours to surrender to the Eggman Empire. Total badass. It is now up to the heroes to find Eggman and stop him. Tails determines the president is on a limo and has had communications with the Mad Doctor and sets off to find him. After stealing a CD, Tails stares at it and determines Eggman is transmitting from the Space Colony Ark. I am going to be charitable here and pretend that is how satellite communication works. Next, the heroes determine Eggman went up to the Space Colony Ark from a pyramid in the desert and they break in. Thankfully, Eggman just happened to have a space shuttle lying around for the heroes to use. which is two hours remaining before Eggman destroys his next target, the heroes thankfully arrive on the Space Colony Ark. Their plan is to destroy the cannon so Eggman cannot use it. Tails has created a fake Chaos Emerald that will reverse the energy field of real Chaos Emeralds, which will blow up the Chaos Emeralds powering the Eclipse Cannon. Seems reasonable. Meanwhile, Knuckles and Rouge continue their, um, tension. Rouge falls off a platform and Knuckles saves her. This is charming enough? However, Rouge is a bat. She has wings. She can fly. I bring this up again because the game is not clear on how serious I should be taking the story. Are the segments just here to get the player from one exotic locale to another, or is it a deep experience with layers of depth? Because when I scratch below the surface, I find myself wondering why chaos is not in the Master Emerald, or how telecommunication hacking works, or why a bat cannot fly. Moving on, the heroes arrive at the Space Colony Ark, ready to foil Eggman's plans. However, Eggman will not go down without a fight. He is holding Amy hostage and demands Sonic give him the seventh Chaos Emerald. Unfortunately, Tails spills the beans about it being fake and Eggman jettisons Sonic to the Earth. This is a dark scene as Tails is responsible for the death of Sonic the Hedgehog. How did you know it wasn't the real world? Tails? <laughs> because you just told me. Thankfully, Sonic uses Chaos Control to escape the capsule and warps back to the ship, saving Tails a lifetime of therapy. Sonic then battles his new rival, inserts the fake emerald into the Eclipse Cannon, which implodes as expected, thus ruining Eggman's plans for world domination. The hero story is competent for sure, though is still a little fluffy. For example, Knuckles seems shoehorned in, with his Master Emerald quest rarely intersecting with Sonic in a meaningful way. The Master Emerald does not power the Eclipse Cannon. Eggman and steals the thing and then sort of forgets about it the rest of the way. Sonic and Tails' side quest to find the president is also a little silly. The Space Colony arc is not exactly hiding, and it is in the shape of Eggman's face. Award winning, the story is not. Still, as a lighthearted adventure about a blue hedgehog racing around the world trying to stop a mad scientist, it works well enough. 
So, now it is time for the dark story. Where Sonic Adventure often failed to use its intersecting stories in meaningful ways, rarely providing new information or offering deeper meaning into the events, and instead just repeating the same cutscenes or giving flimsy reasons why characters interact, the dark story mostly succeeds. This begins right away, with Eggman searching for a top secret military weapon created by his grandfather. That top secret weapon is Shadow the Hedgehog. Shadow instructs Eggman to gather the Chaos Emeralds and meet him on the Space Colony Ark. Players will learn Shadow stole a Chaos Emerald from the Federal Reserve Bank, not Sonic. This explains why the government agents at the beginning of the game were holding Sonic. I like this. What I do not like are the flashbacks. Much like Adventure 1, Adventure 2 features flashbacks to help fill in the backstory. The first flashback shows Shadow and a girl named Maria running from something or someone on the space colony. Maria captures Shadow in the capsule, similar to Sonic in the present time, asks Shadow to do something, and then jettisons him off to the planet below. That something is revenge. Next, players learn a little more about Rouge the Bat. It seems she followed Eggman to the desert base and has located a space transporter she can use to follow Eggman up to the Ark. She mentions it is her mission, giving a clue she might be working for someone and is more than just a jewel thief. Eggman catches up to Shadow on the Ark and learns his grandfather created the space colony along with the Eclipse Cannon, capable of destroying an entire planet. Rouge also makes her presence known, and the three of them devise a plan to gather the seven Chaos Emeralds so Eggman can begin his empire. This is all reasonable enough. Eggman frees Shadow, and the two have mutual interests in world domination. Rouge offers her hunting assistance in exchange for a gem radar. And the plot is progressing. During another flashback, we see Maria, Gerald's granddaughter, and Shadow having a conversation on the Ark. It seems Gerald wanted to benefit human kind through the power of science, by creating things like Shadow and the Eclipse Cannon, I guess. It is around this point where the story begins to lose me. Up until now, the cutscenes do their job of getting the characters from point A to point B in a reasonable, though sometimes silly, manner. However, as the dark side story wears on, the tone of the story shifts. I am no longer watching a story about a hedgehog racing around the world to defeat an evil doctor. There are more plot threads to ponder, so ponder I shall. While hinted at earlier, it is now clear Rouge is an agent of some sort reporting to her superiors about Project Shadow. She even gloats about tricking Eggman. Next is perhaps the best bit of storytelling in Sonic Adventure 2. Earlier, it appeared Tails gave away the Emerald was fake and thus caused the death of Sonic. However, here on the dark side, we can see Eggman knew there was a fake Emerald the entire time. Therefore, when Eggman blamed Fox Boy, he was bluffing, letting Tails feel the guilt even though it was not Tails' fault. It is a sinister moment and perhaps the deepest plot thread found in the game. Game. After this fiasco, Shadow catches Ruse pondering taking the six Chaos Emeralds Eggman has gathered up to this point. It dawns on him Rouge the Bat might be the government spy Rouge the Bat, and this begs all sorts of questions. How did Shadow learn about this government spy when deactivated or sleeping for the past 50 years, only being awake for at best two days? Additionally, why do Sonic and Shadow believe there can only be one real hedgehog, yet Shadow thinks there are multiple Rouge the Bats? Perhaps Rouge is a common bat name. I cannot be certain, but it makes cutscenes like this extra cringy. I can accept goofy cutscenes when they are getting the character from one point to another, but whenever the game tries to offer a plot twist, I am often finding the scenarios quite implausible. Speaking of implausible, Rouge finds the files on Project Shadow she is looking for, and Project Shadow looks nothing like the Shadow we have come to know and love. Shadow is unfazed with this news, however, and warns Rouge to leave the Emeralds alone so Eggman can take over the world and Shadow can fulfill his promise to Maria. Sadly, or fortunately, depending on one's perspective, when Eggman puts the seventh Chaos Emerald into the Eclipse Cannon, something goes wrong. Presumably, Sonic has destroyed the weapon. In any case, while the hero side story was straightforward and reasonably logical, the dark side story is a bit more convoluted. It seems convenient the president has a government spy investigating Project Shadow at the exact right moment. However, Rouge accomplishes virtually nothing, with Shadow intercepting her before she can swipe the six Chaos Emeralds from the Eclipse Cannon and succeed. In retrospect, Knuckles is similar. He just happens to run into Sonic and Tails while while recollecting the fragmented pieces of the Master Emerald. Maybe his wisdom is necessary to find the keys in the desert and pilot a space shuttle? I do not know. This generation of Sonic games receives criticism for having excessive character rosters. Sonic teams seem to have a thing for expanding the Sonic universe. However, I do not think the problem is the amount of characters, rather their poor integration. New characters are introduced, but they often do not serve a purpose. With the hero and dark side stories finished, the final story is online. 
unlocked. Surprisingly, the Space Colony arc is now heading towards the Earth at terminal velocity. Also surprisingly, a video play showing Eggman's grandfather Jerry delivering a message to Earth. The Space Colony arc will collide with the Earth in about 28 minutes, destroying everyone. How does someone who has been dead for 50 years hack into a television system that did not exist? Again, I do not know. It seems everything the old doctor loved had been taken, upsetting him. This video is even more nonsensical as Gerald is chained to a chair. Once finished, a background voice from the video asks if there is anything else Gerald wants to say, followed by ready, almost as if there's a firing squad waiting to execute him. So if this was the final moments of the professor's life, how did he record the footage and program it to play once the seven Chaos Emeralds were inserted into the Eclipse Cannon? It does not make sense, and this clip always sucks me right out of the story. Instead of accepting the quirkiness of early 2000s Sonic, I instead question everything about early 2000s Sonic. Next, Eggman finds a recorded diary from the old professor, which gives some additional backstory from 50 years prior. It seems the military was not keen on Project Shadow and invaded the Space Colony Ark to destroy the project and shut down the colony. Somehow, Maria died when the colony was shut down, yet Gerald lived. With Project Shadow shut down and Maria gone, Professor Gerald went insane and wanted to avenge the death of his granddaughter. He finished Project Shadow and now it is ready to destroy the world. Of course, when Maria was alive, she launches Shadow to Earth, so the Project Shadow the Professor completed is a different one. Okay then. With the arc set on the collision course to Earth, the heroes and dark characters team up to reach the core of the arc and use the Master Emerald, which is now a fraction of its previous size, to neutralize the Chaos Emeralds and somehow stop the arc. Again, very convenient. Speaking of convenient, Amy runs into Shadow and urges him to assist with the plan. However, as Shadow is still in revenge mode, he declines. However, he then has another flashback and remembers Maria does not want revenge, she wants the people on Earth to be happy. Therefore, now Shadow saves the Earth. The big plot twist, the moment everything in the game builds up to, is this. Shadow misremembered something. This is stupid. Payoff without setup. Rouge briefly alludes to the fact Shadow's memories might not be real, but even this is generous. Had the story followed some sort of logical path of Shadow trying to remember his past, deciphering what is real and what is not, and overcoming an internal conflict to arrive at this pivotal moment, it could have been really deep and meaningful. However, this does not occur. Everything in Sonic Adventure 2 feels like a happy accident. Amy says the people of Earth are good. Shadow is like, oh yeah, I guess I'll save the Earth now. The Storytelling is about as deep as a puddle. A better example of handling memory loss and the complex emotions that come with slowly piecing things together would be the Bourne films. In it, the protagonist has to work to regain his memories and deal with the complex emotions that come from learning what he is and where he came from. Jason Bourne does not just wake up and remember everything one morning. The plot continues as Sonic and Knuckles reach the dome housing Project Shadow. Upon entering, more Professor Gerald cutscenes play. How is the professor able to record these while chained to a chair awaiting his death? Who knows? With Shadow now on Team Sonic, he destroys the prototype. Knuckle uses the Master Emerald to neutralize the Chaos Emeralds, but this does not resolve the issue, so yeah, thanks Knuckles for your contributions. The prototype does a Chaos Control to warp outside the arc and pull it to Earth himself. Sonic and Shadow then do a questionable hand gesture, which enables them to go super. I'm not making this up, this literally happens in Sonic Adventure 2. Upon defeating the prototype, a second time, Super Sonic and Super Shadow use Chaos Control to send the Ark back on a stable orbit around the Earth, ending the threat for good. Sadly, while Sonic makes it aboard the Ark, Shadow falls to Earth, presumably sacrificing himself and succeeding in his mission to fulfill Maria's wish, for the people of Earth to be happy. As is pretty obvious, I do not care for this story. While there are moments of foreshadowing, little of the plot seems thoughtful. Events just sort of happen accidentally or conveniently. I rarely stop and conclude, oh, that was clever. Instead, the plot twists are usually of the dumb variety. Throwing a tantrum like a little kid. How totally embarrassing. Don't forget your end. And much like the first game, I feel like the designers are doing little more than wasting my time. Sure, some have fond memories of Sonic Adventure 2 and are able to find deep meaning in virtually every cutscene found in the game. However, I am unable to reach these same conclusions. 
The plot is poor. The story is very simple. Eggman wants to use his grandfather's secret project to take over the world. Through the release of Shadow, Eggman discovers the Space Colony arc and Eclipse Cannon. Sonic chases Eggman across the planet, destroys the Eclipse Cannon, and then transforms to Super Sonic to destroy Project Shadow and thus foil Robotnik yet again. It is simple, and the gameplay provided matches this simple story. However, the developers added so much fluff to try and mask what is ultimately a basic plot, and I do not understand why. The flashbacks, the president, a government spy, and Professor Gerald are added in in an attempt to add depth to the story, but they fail almost completely. These cutscenes do not add to the story, but instead take away from it. The story becomes more convoluted, and instead of fleshing out the backstory, they add more inconsistencies than they resolve. No matter how many times I watch and experience them, I always find more problems than I find clarity. Moving on, it is time to talk about the actual gameplay. Across the 30 main stages, there are 10 high-speed platforming stages, 9 treasure hunting stages, 9 mech shooting stages, and 2 kart racing stages. The high-speed action stages are what one would expect from a Sonic game. Sonic and Shadow feel similar enough to the first game, but there have been some additions and tweaks to the gameplay. First, the speed characters can now grind on rails, which is visually interesting for sure and adds some alternate routes and paths through the stages. For a game based Based on speed, this addition fits the high speed gameplay perfectly, and while I wish landing on rails was not so finicky, there is little for me to complain about. A second addition is the somersault. This is useful in combat, but also adds a wrinkle to the gameplay. If a player fails to somersault in time, progress will be halted in certain areas. Players must react to obstacles and press the appropriate button to maneuver through if they want to maintain speed. It is a small addition for sure, but a welcome one. Sonic also finds the bounce bracelet, allowing him to jump higher than normal. This again aids in combat and is occasionally required to reach higher ledges, and speedrunners will find it useful to fall downward faster. Not a game changer, but not offensive either. The level design for the speed characters is more of a mixed bag. The opening stage, City Escape, sets a high bar for the adventure, both aesthetically and technically. My biggest compliment is the sheer variety, with the boarding, complete with trick system which also seems to incorporate sonic speed, the new rail grinding mechanic, a chase sequence, gymnastic bars, and more typical platforming all blended together to create a level that is both visually interesting thanks to the rich, dense city setting, but engaging thanks to the branching paths and different gameplay mechanics. Sadly, this is the high point of Sonic Adventure 2, where City Escape feels rich, vibrant, and interesting, Metal Harbor feels like a bunch of square and rectangular platforms sitting in a sea of blue. Green Forest offers a similar conundrum. Sonic is funneled through lush tubes on his way to the Gold Ring, and everything feels very samey. This tube-like design philosophy continues with Pyramid Cove. Thankfully, the stage does have a few gimmicks. First are these hourglass timers. Once engaged, the player will have a limited amount of time to get through a door. This meshes well with the gameplay. Move quickly and players will find success. Move slowly or play poorly and one will have to try again. A less interesting gimmick are the keys. They offer flashbacks to Amy in SA1 and I do not understand their inclusion. There is potential for this to be interesting. Sonic must hold the key, so so moves like the bounce and homing attack are not available. Therefore, the designers could have designed the segments around tricky enemy or hazard patterns to challenge players to bring the key to its destination while being handicapped with a limited move set. However, they did not. All of these strange design quirks come to a head in Sonic's final stage, Final Rush. It manages to be blocky, tube-like, and rehashed all at the same time. The biggest thing that struck me are these vertical pipes. Sonic needs to homing attack into them, transferring the horizontal energy to vertical energy, allowing upward progression. Unfortunately, the gimmick repeats at least 16 times. When I think back to how Sonic's campaign started in City Escape, I am struck by how far backwards the design and visuals have repeated regressed over the adventure. What was once a rich level filled with variety and unique stage hazards has devolved into floating platforms and repeated stage gimmicks. The gameplay does not get much better with Shadow's four stages. Levels repeat themselves, and nothing ever comes close to the level of thought and care found in City Escape. It is a real shame. This bland level design is hammered home with the mech stages. A decent foundation was laid in Sonic Adventure 1. A timer ticked down and players needed to defeat enemies to add to the clock. The more enemies a player locked onto, the greater the time bonus offered, adding depth and strategy to the gameplay. While SA1 never really pushed the concept to the limits, a real sense of urgency could be found when the timer neared zero. Sadly, instead of building upon this foundation, Sonic Team scrapped the concept altogether. There is no longer a countdown. 
them. Large combos are no longer required to beat stages. The race against the clock gameplay is gone, and with it, any potential for rewarding gameplay. Instead, replaced with repeating the same actions over and over and over. In Iron Gate, for example, Eggman has to break this same door 11 times. That means one door every 18 seconds. That is not a math error. This shooting obstacle, where one wiggles the analog stick until four targets are locked, release the fire button, and then wait a moment while the door explodes, is a major stage gimmick. Hidden Base is another prime example. The player has to break this same crumbling wall 23 times. This works out to breaking a wall every 13 seconds. Fire, 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 repeat every 13 seconds. Sand Ocean suffers from the same repetition. There are large pillars the player must knock down, eight of them in all. Every 35 seconds, the player has to knock one of these down, which forms a platform for progression. This is a mildly interesting way to structure a level, using the weapon to make platforms, but not at this frequency. It would be far more engaging if these falling platforms were part of a puzzle, where strategically knocking down platforms in a specific or clever order was required to unlock the path forward, but no, it is automatic. This continues to get worse as each campaign wears on. Cosmic Wall has Eggman jumping up and then falling down the same tower structure over and over. Eternal Engine suffers a similar fate, with Tails walking through the same corridors over and over. It feels like padding. Rather than crafting clever levels taking advantage of the unique shooting mechanics, brain dead gimmicks are used instead, and then repeated a ridiculous number of times. There is no growth or progression. The mech shooting is a massive step backwards from the first game, which was underdeveloped to begin with. Moving on, we have the treasure hunting stages. Of course, the biggest mechanical change with the game's style is the radar. In the first game, the radar worked on all three treasure pieces at the same time. Combined with the small stages, players could reasonably zip around and complete levels quickly. In Sonic Adventure 2, the radar only works sequentially. A player can still find treasure pieces out of order if they happen to spot one, but the radar has been nerfed hard. I assume the designers did this to prevent the levels from being completed too quickly. Another change is the lack of T'Kal. In the first game, T'Kal would zip in the direction of the treasure, further reducing hunting time. Hint monitors replace T'Kal, giving hints of varying quality. This is possibly another reason why the radar is nerfed, to make sure the hint monitors and radar are working in tandem on the same piece of treasure. Both seem to accomplish their goal of extending playtime and making the hunting a much tougher endeavor, as do the levels themselves. While Sonic Adventure 1 reused set pieces, the treasure hunting in Sonic Adventure 2 feature purpose-built levels, and each has its own gimmick, which I appreciate. Wild Canyon and Dry Lagoon feature stages broken into two distinct parts, with specific gimmicks restricting travel to each part. Pumpkin Hill has a rotating train platform. Death Chamber and Egg Quarters are divided into three colored chambers with paths linking them together. Security Hall features a five minute time limit. Aquatic Mine has changeable water levels, which raise and lower floating platforms unlocking different areas. Finally, Meteor Herd and Mad Space are vertical levels with gravity gimmicks. I appreciate how each is distinct and unique to the treasure hunting gameplay. By most measures, the designers succeeded in improving upon the formula from the first game. However, new problems are introduced. First off, the hint system is not particularly useful for a first time player. Until one has played through a treasure hunting stage multiple times, many of the hints will not be useful as the player is not aware of any key landmarks and some of these stages are massive. This flies counterintuitive to the nerfed radar. For example, in Death Chamber with Knuckles, I walked right past a buried key without knowing it. It was not until later, when the radar was giving information about the next sequential key, that I realized it. Whatever benefits the radar had in working in conjunction with the hint boxes have the consequence of forcing players to backtrack and waste time. The clues are not always that great anyway. This treasure is not on a sandy path. This treasure is not in the shadows. The treasure hunting is likely where new players will hit some pace-breaking brick walls. Death Chamber will likely trip up first-timers, especially on the Dreamcast port. The GameCube port adds an exclamation mark when a player is over a buried emerald, making it easier to identify where to dig, though it is not foolproof. Still, I have wasted many a minutes on the Dreamcast version digging for emerald shards with the radar pulsing away at full clip. 
Much of it is luck based as well. A clue like under the red light does not give the player any indication on which way to head next. Moreover, if one picks the wrong direction, they are adding minutes to their playtime. On my two recorded runs, I completed Death Chamber once in 6 minutes 42 seconds and a second time in 12 minutes 57 seconds. This doubled time does not represent reduced skill, just unlucky treasure placement. Meteor Herd is another troubling stage. The first two clues provided in this example are a lot of meteorites and jump from the star. After finding what appears to be a logical place to jump from a star, the radar remains silent and I carry on hovering everywhere trying to get a blip on the radar to no avail. After obtaining a third clue, farthest meteorite you see after using the spring, it appears my initial instincts were in fact correct, despite the radar. Using the spring again, I was able to get a blip on the radar. The problem is, there is an invisible barrier marking the edge of the stage. However, there are meteorites on the other side of the barrier. Without a visual clue, there is no way for the player to know which meteorite is in fact the farthest one away. I'm sorry, but this is poor design. Even worse, when the player fails to find the correct meteorite, they have to painstakingly make their way back up the stage and reach the spring to get another attempt. This repetition is incredibly tedious. Worse yet, on this playthrough, I finally located the correct meteorite and broke it, but did not receive the emerald shard. So now, when I hit the spring, I have to try and spot a tiny emerald shard in the distance, with no camera controls. Worse yet, the game engine is designed in a way where small objects in the distance will not even appear on the screen. Here, we can clearly see the emerald appear from thin air, meaning even if the player is facing the correct direction, it might not be visible. While someone who has spent hundreds of hours with Sonic Adventure 2 might not run into these issues, newcomers to the franchise likely will. Hitting one of these unlucky spawns, having to find meteorites out in space, and then trying to find something that may or may not be on the screen can be a frustrating experience. While some seasoned players cannot comprehend how one could spend a half hour on an emerald hunt and chalking it up to get good, these are real experiences people have when playing Sonic Adventure 2. The next troubling stage is, of course, Security Hall. First off, the five minute time limit is ridiculous. The only other stage on my two recorded runs where I finished in under five minutes twice was the very first one, Wild Canyon. Second, the game forgets to clue the player in on a very important gameplay element. Some safes are locked. To unlock them, the player needs to travel all the way to the top of the stage and hit a switch. Until a player figures this out, as I could not get any of the Omachows to tell me this, this stage will be a crapshoot. If the treasure is not in a locked safe, the player has a chance. If it is in a locked safe, good luck. I like the gimmick aspect of it, a switch opening a door that is not three feet away. However, I do not understand why the game fails to communicate this to the player in a reasonable way. Last but not least is Mad Space. Like Meteor Herd, the treasure respawns will likely dictate how tolerable this stage is. On my final recorded run, I got this gem of a spawn. If the player hits the train where the treasure is, they fall. Okay. On another attempt, Rouge's ear even clips through the emerald shard but it does not register. As the emerald is floating in the air and moving, the player will have to travel back around the planetoid to get another attempt, adding precious minutes to the stage time. In short, the treasure hunting is awful. While on paper it should be superior to the first game, in practice it is much worse. The radar should not have been nerfed. The collision detection should be better. Emerald shards should not disappear when the player is too far away. Moreover, Meteor Herd and Mad Space should have been designed in a way where vertical progression could be accomplished with the climbing abilities, rather than specific springs and rockets. The last playstyle is kart racing. Rouge and Tails each have a kart stage and the physics are surprisingly deep. Not as crisp as Ridge Racer or anything, but I did get a kick out of maintaining a drift through long bends by feathering the throttle and massaging the steering input. Sadly, the track design is far too simple though, with large straights, few obstacles, and few technical areas taking advantage of the tight controls. But it is clear someone put care into the controls, and the result is pleasant. Also sprinkled across both campaigns are boss fights and character battles. The character battles are again nauseating and I'm puzzled at their inclusion. Granted they are technically superior to the button mash fests found in SA1, but barely. Shadow and Sonic amount to rolling into each other while they stand still. The final encounter has a timing element, I guess, but this is hardly an epic conclusion to what could have been an awesome rivalry. 
Tails and Eggman are just painful. They suffer an Amy problem. In Adventure 1, if Amy turned too sharply, her speed would decrease drastically. This amazing work of physics was incorporated into the mech gameplay. Mind you, Tails and Eggman battle in circular arenas, meaning they are always turning. So, by following the flow of the stage, the characters slow down, running counterintuitive to dodging attacks. Knuckles and Rouge are not much better. Wait for the opposing character to stop attacking, then attack and hope it registers a hit. But it probably won't. Why are these all so bad? To be fair, doppelganger fights were poor in other iconic games as well. The traditional boss battles fare a bit better. The gunships are mostly harmless, a standard dodge phase and then a vulnerability phase where the player can attack. With some good timing and precision, players can also get in extra attacks speeding up the flow, which I greatly appreciate. Egg Golem is also great. Sonic needs to race behind it, jump on platforms, and homing attack up to its head to inflict damage. The battle works because it actually uses Sonic's skill set of speed, jumping, and homing attacks. If the player is proficient with the moveset, the battle will go quickly. If not, it will take longer. King Boom Boo is great as well. The player needs to dodge attacks and wait for an opening to hit a timer, which lets light into the room. During this phase, the player will need to dig into the ground or wall to weaken the ghost and then get in a hit. I also learned with some quick timing, one could hit the boss twice in one phase, which is awesome. Quicker fights with skillful play. Like Egg Golem, the battle puts the moveset of the character to good use and becomes a test of skill and precision, rather than endurance, making for an engaging fight. Sadly, Sonic Adventure 2 focuses more on poor character battles battles than actual bosses, so these thoughtful fights are rare. This brings us to the final two battles in the game, against the prototype Shadow. These both feel pretty rough and unrefined. The homing attack in Sonic Adventure 2 does not always feel accurate and seems to have a mind of its own, meaning sometimes the player will flat out not hit an enemy or hit an enemy but take damage instead. This lack of precision with the maneuver can make the fight against the prototype maddening as the player homes into nothing. Like every 3D Sonic prior to Sonic Colors, the final fight is a crapshoot as well, with the flight mechanics lacking any sort of precision and receiving an attack being a common occurrence. Still, the timer is generous and I cleared this on my first try on all three playthroughs endured for this review. Control issues are not limited to the homing attack though. I would often not do a ring dash, instead somersaulting or worse, bouncing into a death pit. Enemies drop down from the sky without any telegraphs. Enemies will attack the moment a door opens, and projectiles will surprise the player from off screen. Thankfully, same as ever, as long as the player has a ring, they will not perish. Minus the mech stages anyway. Again, it reminds me of how often the designers use the ring as a crutch for poor enemy placement and behavior. It looks, feels, and is slow. Sloppy. This is not an old game is old issue either. Between playing Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2, I fired up Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus for the PlayStation 2 and beat it. The game was released about a year after Sonic Adventure 2 and does not have any of these problems. Button inputs always performed the desired action. Stages were not copy pasted over and over and over. The story matches the gameplay and does not wander off on strange tangents that break the continuity of the adventure. Moreover, the plot twist at the end makes sense. So, no, I reject the notion that all six generation platformers have aged at the same rate to Sonic Adventure 2. It is not true. So, here we are, nearing the end of the video. I came into this project trying to challenge myself to think about Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 in different ways. I love Sonic Adventure, but wanted to challenge myself to see past my own biases to find out why people dislike it so much. Next on my agenda was to challenge my own personal biases and find the objectively good moments in Sonic Adventure 2. Unfortunately, I am unable to find a good game lurking behind a few nitpicky issues. Instead, what I learned is that I do not have a personal bias against Sonic Adventure 2. The story is absurd. The mech levels feature some of the laziest stage design I have ever witnessed in a 3D platformer. Treasure hunting has some of the most painful difficulty spikes I have ever experienced in a video game. On top of some control issues, questionable enemy placement, and a substandard presentation, I am unable to conclude the good outweighs the bad. Only the opposite. A part of me assumed playing Sonic Adventure first left me with some sort of nostalgic 
bias against Sonic Adventure 2. However, with both games fresh on my mind after playing extensively, this is not the case. Sonic Adventure pads out playtime with repeated cutscenes and weak campaigns. Sonic Adventure 2 pads out playtime with copy-paste stage design and frustrating treasure hunting. Both games are unquestionably below average. Like in June of 2001, I find myself in front of a TV playing Sonic Adventure 2, with the voice in the back of my head telling me this should be better. And it is not.